Okay, so imagine that uh, you had the chance to meet uh, Professor Riemann one afternoon, and then he came to you and say, I found a marvelous function whose zero are all on the axis one half. That you might be curious, surprised, puzzled, but you have no time even to think that the next day come Professor de Richelet and tell you, look, I found another function who has uh, the zero, the real part, not the imaginary part, on the same axis one half. Then he came also the Richelet the next day and say, I found another function, always on the axis one half. Another one, always on the axis one half. Another one. So to make the story short, there are an infinite class of functions who has all the real part on uh, the one half axis. Now I want to convince you that uh, the reason of that is the existence of underlying Brownian motion behind these functions and the growth of Brownian motion, which is universal, goes like square root of n, so one half. And this implies actually the existence of uh, limit central uh, theorem. This uh, uh, robust feature of statistical feature or statistical physics implies that all the zeros of this function has to be on the axis one half. So this is the main thesis, okay? Simple as this, alias, statistical physics provide us a very natural, a universal way of understanding why the zeros of an infinite number of function out of which Riemann is only one, as always the zero on the axis one half. Now in the story, there are some subtleties, alias there is uh, this uh, subtle epsilon which appear. This epsilon, you have to mean really like log log correction to the power law. And uh, you will see that log correction never can spoil the location of these zeros, okay? So this is the thesis. This has been the subject of a series of paper with Andre Leclerc. And the last one is a few, uh, two months ago, where there is a very detailed analysis of all, uh, will, of all of what I will claim later. So the topics of my seminar is, uh, I will spend some time uh, on the tension which exists between randomness versus determinism. Then I will introduce the Riemann hypothesis, then the Dirichlet characters, the L function and all that. At that point, we are ready to understand the, really the general picture, which is the generalized Riemann hypothesis. And then I'll, uh, at the end, I will tell you for whom the bell tolls, actually. So let me address the first questions, question, randomness versus determinism. Now, all of us uh, consider number theory as a field which is ruled uh, by military deterministic law of arithmetic, where randomness seems to play really no role. So you can ask, what the hell are you talking about? But is it really so? Well, I would like to undermine this certainty of view and uh, open the, the road to the following considerations. Now, I'm will, uh, going to use two examples out of many, actually. These are just two very simple examples. And the first one is some arithmetic tales from the world of pi. And the other one is about the strange realm of large numbers. Now, let me talk about law and disorder in pi. Now, pi is uh, the feature to have a beautiful and stunning regular formulas, which are actually one of the most beautiful in mathematics, which display a huge regularity. This is one of them. Another one is this, the Valles formula. Another one is a series expansion which involves Fibonacci and all that. So you see, these are really law, the law of pi. There is uh, really a, in a, a rigid uh, deterministic regularity. Well, let's take another point of view. Let's express pi in uh, decibel digit. What I'm going to say in the following actually holds in any basis. So this uh, decimal de basis is just an example, but you can choose base three, five, 16, whatever you like. And this point, uh, this is a bunch of numbers. 
and then you might wonder how they are distributed. If you do just an analysis in decades, so I take blocks of 10, 100, millions, and so on and so forth, I just count the digit which are in that block, you start discovering they are pretty regular. And when you do so, and you display an histogram, you find out that they are completely uniform. Now, you go back to Pi and now say, what about if I start picking numbers jumping irregularly with a period? I choose here six, but you can choose eight, 10, or 11, whatever you like. You take the digit selected by this uh, sieve and you plot it. What you find? Uniformity, absolutely uniform distribution. So this means that since you can change the period that you're uh, like, these numbers are completely uncorrelated. Actually, you can even make jump which are completely random. You collect the digit, you make the histogram, what you find? Completely uniform distributions. At this point, the average of this digit, therefore, is 4.5. If you work it out a displacement function, alias how much these uh, differ from the average, and you ask how this function is distributed, it's enough that you do very simple test. Here I just show you for 20,000 digits that you start to suspect that behind there is a Gaussian law. Okay. Now let me jump to another example the strange realm of large numbers. Now, any natural numbers admit a one and only one uh, decomposition in primes. So when you do this decomposition, let me define a function which uh, tell us exactly how many distinct prime are in the number, okay? In this example, you see there were kappa primes of different exponents, this function omega I'm defining is just the number of primes. Now, of course, this function is fluctuating. And uh, you want to ask what is the average of omega and how omega is distributed? Please keep in mind that everything is deterministic. There is no random whatsoever. You take a number and you deterministically uh, determine its factor and its divisor. Okay, so there is no random whatsoever. However, I'm doing a different kind of questions. Well, for instance, imagine I explore the, the vicinity of 10 to the 60. You find for this omega, a bunch of numbers, which looks completely crazy and, uh, and casual. If you have a bit uh, uh, more uh, acute, you find out the average of this number scale like log log of n. And by the way, think that this imply that if you take integer number of order 10 to the thousand, which are astronomically, these numbers in average has only seven different prime in it. Now, when you make the histogram of omega, you find this curve. And actually, in this case is a theorem, is one of the most beautiful theorem which exists in number theory is called erdos katz theorem that says for large n, the variable omega n minus the average divide the variance, which in this case coincide with the square root of the average is normal distributed. I'm talking about numbers and, uh, and experiments on set which are completely deterministic, okay? Now, let me go back uh, now to Dr. Riemann, how I started the seminar. Now, Riemann uh, in uh, 1859, uh, 1859 was his uh, Annus Mirabilis because he got professorship in Gottingen and the same year he was elected the fellow of the Berlin Academy of Science. And that occasion he has to present a paper, a manuscript, and he decided to investigate the problem about uh, the number of primes less than a given magnitude. So this is the manuscript, the first page, and uh, this is available online. Uh, if you're curious, you can go and uh, take it. If you go to page three, you find these sentences. Is obviously in uh, that in uh, in German. I translate in English. He says, "It is very probable that they are all along this line." 
of course, it would be desiderable to have a rigorous proof, blah, 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 blah. He's talking about the zeros, in which uh, he conjectured that the zeros of this function were along the line one half. Now, let me underline the Riemann hypothesis and generalize of it is regarded among the most important problem of mathematics for the last 150 years. What I mean by that? Well, you can come and say there are many, many other famous and important uh, problems. Let's say Fermat last theorem. There are very famous and, uh, well, you know what was the Gauss opinion on that. He was never interested in Fermat because he say, I can invent a dozen of these problems. So the reason is that uh, theorem like Fermat are completely sterile. So are probably completely complicated to prove it, but after you cannot do much about it. You cannot use it. There is no consequences or not deep consequences of it. This is completely different for the case of the Riemann uh, hypothesis and the Riemann zeta function of that, because this has an impact on our knowledge of distribution of primes, growth of many arithmetic functions, zero zeta function, as uh, a lot of connection with random matrices and quantum chaos in physics, a general theory of phase transition like location of Fisher zero and all that. Now the subject is pretty old, it's actually 160 years, it's pretty large, it's a huge immense uh, reference on it. Let me just point out very few of them. So the classic of Edwards that was written long ago, but is really an uh, enjoyable book. And then some uh, book where uh, you can find a lot of these uh, uh, various uh, formulation Riemann hypothesis. As well, there are uh, interesting uh, uh, divulgative uh, uh, books on the subject, uh, like the one I presented here. So I have to tell you what is the Riemann zeta function. So the Riemann zeta function is the function C zeta of S, S is the complex variable, that can be defined in two equivalent ways in their domain of convergence, which is the real part of S bigger than one. So you can define it as a series. This is a, the general form of a Dirichlet series, or you can find as an infinite product on the prime. Now, the origin of this inequality, this inequality is pretty simple because if you develop the product in terms of the geometric series, you find that this is the, the generic term, when you start making the product of this term, you find that uh, uh, you are collecting all and all the integers because once again, by the uh, fundamental theory of arithmetics, any integer has one and only one decomposition in terms of primes. Since there are all the primes here, you get all and only, and this justify the term on the left-hand side. Now, from a physicist point of view, this identity is pretty beautiful because you can uh, interpret in different ways. Imagine that you have a free bosonic system, really free, whose energy of each component is the logarithmic of the prime. This actually is an allowed spectrum, by the way. So at this point, you have your uh, uh, levels, and since are bosonic, you can populate as much as you like. So at this point, you can compute the partition function, but you can compute in two different ways. You can compute as a grand canonical ensemble, or you can compute as a micro canonical ensemble. And you see this identity of Euler is nothing else than the equivalence of ensembles in statistical physics. Okay, you can interpret this way. Now, S is therefore is the inverse of temperature. Now, what is the property in the complex plane of S? Since the density of states of this system grows exponentially, you should expect to find a critical temperature, which in particle physics is known like Agedon temperature, where the system just blows up because the density of states grow so fast that at the end, the temperature cannot kill it. So the pole at S equal one, physically you can interpret really as a divergence of uh, the density of states. So this, uh, the physical system behind the Riemann interpreted as partition function only exists for low temperature cases. So on the right hand side of the axis S equal one. Well, I have to stress that any Dirichlet function has domain of convergence, which are always half line. 
So this is pretty important for what I'm going to say later, but this is a, just an example. So you might ask, uh, and so what about the high temperature phases? Well, you have to do analytic continuation where uh, Professor Riemann was the magician, he invented. So he just found the formula which allow him to go above the Hercule columna given by S equal one. And this way, he find out a functional equation which uh, allowed him to compute quantity uh, a, a below S equal one using the value which were above and where you can use the convergence of the series. Now, this is the functional equation. Look how it's done. So he connected S with one minus S with factor which are completely familiar. So sinus and gamma function, okay? So keep in mind this, because when I ask uh, what are the complex uh, uh, structure of this function? Well, in the complex plane, there are certain set of zeros which are definitely certain. These come really from the sinus and gamma function. This term I just show you. And then there are an infinite number of zeros which live within the strip zero and one. Now, Riemann make the hypothesis that all these zero were on the like on the axis one half, even though it's functional equation, which uh, in uh, physics language is called duality, only tell you that if you have a zeros out of the axis, necessarily should be another zeros below it, because you connect S with one minus S. So as I say, it is natural to think that uh, if uh, they are on the like all the axis one half, then the companion of these zeros is also on the axis one half. So this is where the origin of the conjecture come from. But strictly speaking, the duality equation that Riemann derived didn't necessarily imply that they were on the axis, only imply this picture you have under your eyes here. Now, how do we know that there are infinite number of them? Well, this is a pretty, the calculation is complicated, but the principle is simple. You just compute uh, the logarithmic residue for this function. Riemann did the first calculation, but then was uh, refined later. And then you discover that more you increase the height of this strip, more zeros you find. So n of t is the number of zeros up to the height t. And they grow like t log of t. So there are infinite number of them. And actually their location has been really the race and the challenge of many people along the years, including Alan Turing, that really construct one of his computer to compute the first 100,000, the first 1,000 of this zero, uh, aiming to disproving Riemann, but finding out that they were all on the axis one half. Now, presently, the record is much higher than what is shown here. But as you can understand, it's really something that people have, uh, have uh, work on and always has been confirmed, this, this conjecture. So uh, by the way, the distribution of zero give rise to beautiful physics because you can really build up quantum chaology on this. This was really the brilliant idea of Michael Berry years ago. You can connect to random matrices and all that. I do not have time to dig all this, but this is really marvelous and beautiful uh, connection with many, many area of uh, mathematics, physics, and this and that. Now, what I show you looks really military implemented. So you might ask yourself, where the hell is this randomness that Musardo is talking about? So where shall I look for this? Now, what I'm going to show you in the next uh, slides is not a proof at all. I'm just giving you a glimpse of where the randomness of the Riemann function come from. And then we come back later and, uh, and dig more on this. So instead, instead of the Riemann, take the inverse of the Riemann. Now, in terms of the infinite product, when it converge, so real part of S larger than one, this is expressed like this. At this point, make this, uh, this product and start expressing in terms of a series, because you can make all the possible product of these, of these terms. What you discover? You discover that this time, there are not all the integers, as was for the Riemann. 
there are only some integers. Which one? The one which are made only at most of one prime, no more than one. And the reason is that uh, for this infinite product, you cannot collect one half more than one. So this guy can hit one third, one five, whatever, but you cannot take one half twice. So the number of prime, sorry, the quality, the, the class of prime, the integer which are entering this series are only this kind of uh, uh, natural numbers and noticed that the sign which is in front of them depend how many terms the number is made of, okay? Now these uh, are called square free numbers. So the, this is the, the, the square free number are all the natural numbers whose decomposition in prime contain at most one prime. If you want, from this point of view, the primes behave more as a fermion like the, the bosons for the original Riemann function. And the race is actually the mu is nothing else than the fermionic number of this, uh, of this uh, number itself because they tell you how many fermions you have inside. Now, let uh, me uh, tell you a little more about these square free numbers. For instance, what is the density of square free numbers among the integers? Well, the calculation you can do really on an on a, on a envelope if you argue like this. Assuming no correlation between numbers, between primes, one over p is the probability that uh, any natural number x is divisible by the prime p, simply because any P numbers is divided by P. So you interpret what is deterministic now probabilistically. If you accept this, uh, one minus one of P square is the probability that a number X is not divisible by a prime P more than one time. So if you want to know the probability that you get uh, square free numbers, you just take all the infinite product of them. But this is just the inverse of the Riemann two. But this is known six over pi square, and the number is 0 0.607927. Now, you got something. This is a bold calculation. You might believe it or not. I mean, it's, uh, but you can check it. So the way to check it is uh, you take the integer and you start uh, erasing all the square free numbers. And once you have done this, you count how many red spots you get out of n. So you can do your calculate this calculation yourself. This is the result. You see, very, very fastly, this number goes asymptotically to six over pi squared. So the calculation is completely deterministic once again, but the result you can predict probabilistically. Okay. So the square free number is a finite density in the integer. So you can do very good arithmetics on them essentially are equivalent to integers, essentially, okay? It's not a tiny fraction, it's a finite fraction of the integers. Now, let me illustrate uh, the beauty of the Melling transform, which is the key point of understanding uh, the origin of this uh, location of the zeros. So I'm telling you that the inverse of Riemann is expressed in terms of square free numbers with uh, this mu, which can take value plus and minus one, depending on how many factors you have. Now, it's a very simple to uh, express a series in terms of uh, integral. It's a really a trick. I think it's called a billion uh, summation, whatever. I mean, it's very simple identity where the density of the melding is nothing else than the sum of the coefficient of the series up to the integer part of x, okay? So I'm telling you that the inverse of the Riemann is expressed in terms of this melding. And the density of this melding is just the sum of this coefficient mu hat n. Now, do just uh, some experimental mathematics. You just uh, see how these mu are, are distributed. So you start computing and you start observing there is plus and minus one, plus and minus one, completely random. I mean, at least it looks like that. At the end of the day, I'm gonna show you that this is precise the case. But here I'm just taking the attitude of a very ingenuous people say, what the hell, let me see how they are. And when you compute the sum of these numbers, what you discover that the function is completely crazy like this. 
and how is growing square root of eight. Okay. It's not approved, guys. I'm just telling, I'm just doing experimental mathematics, nothing else at this level. But it's true that if I was able to prove, and if I am able, I'm able to prove that this density mx goes like square root of x, is a mathematical fact that the integral diverge a real part of s equal one half. And if this is true, one over c is the first singularity, the real part of x, one half. Remember, if uh, zeta is zeros, one over c is a pole. So what I'm telling you is that if I'm able to prove that this density grows like one half, essentially you spot the origin of the singularity alias the location of the poles. Because you have duality, if you are able to arrive up to the line one half without never being stopped before, you know that all the zeros, there are infinite number of them, has to be all on the line one half, okay? Not some, all. Because if you were stopped before, then would exist another zero which are offline and then finish, end of the day. But if I'm able to arrive up to the line one half, this shows that all and only the zeros are on the line one half. Now, to understand better this story, uh, we have to take the usual, uh, or better, you have to take a path that has proved to be successful in mathematics many, many, many times. What, what I'm talking about. You may have in mathematics many curious facts. For instance, the fact that you cannot solve the quintic by algebraic equation, by algebraic uh, function, by, sorry, by algebraic formula. So this might look an oddity to you. But once you develop a large perspective on the problem, group theory, at this point, uh, this appears just an example or a very general fact. So what I'm saying is, if you want to understand some fact, in the past uh, has been uh, a very successful attitude to look the general, the general setting behind this and look if you can understand some, uh, some more uh, general feature rather than a very peculiar one. So with this, uh, with this uh, uh, consideration, let me go now and discuss the Dirichlet L functions, which I'm going to show you is the generalization, infinite, actually infinite number of generalization of Riemann. Riemann at the end will be just a very, very simple case of, of all this class of functions. So in order to do so, I have to spend some time in uh, illustrating what are the features of this function. Pretty simple mathematics, but is, is uh, worth understanding in detail this fact because they are simple but deep at the same time. Now, you know that the rich lab belong to the same club of Gottingen number theorists, which include Gauss, Riemann, and the rich lab himself. He was actually the founder of analytic number theory, and uh, he studied in Paris, but then he got a uh, professorship in Berlin and then in Gottingen. So he was interested in arithmetic progression. Namely, you take two integer numbers, Q and H, which are called modulus and residue. Essentially, you divide a number by Q and see what, what remain. And ask the following question, under which condition on Q and H, on the modulus and the residue, the sequence contain infinite number of primes? Now imagine that the usual prime are the sequence are 2n plus one, because by definition, the primes are odd. So, the Richelieu was trying to generalize the question in general modulus and residue. And amazingly enough, the answer is very, very simple. He got a theorem that say, in order to have an infinite number of primes, Q and H must be co-prime. Co-prime means they do not share a common divisor one with the other. This is not only necessary, which is obvious, but also sufficient. Let me give you some example. Imagine you take the sequence 5n plus 3. You vary n and you collect the integer on the way. And you see, you start spotting many, many primes, the one in yellows, along the sequence. You take another sequence, 5n with residue 2. 
you just run M and you see that there are many, many primes in it, okay? Now, all this uh, uh, straight line are parallel straight line which just differ from the intercept. So it's true that any prime should belong to one of them uh, necessarily. So for instance, if you run this example, you will find that seven is here, 11 is here, 13 is here, 19, 23, no, uh, nine, 17, 19, uh, 23, 29, 31, and so on and so forth. Actually, if you do a bit of experimental mathematics, you will find that the density along this line are constant. Namely, you will find the same number of points along each of these lines. And importantly enough, this is not an observation, this is a theorem. This is a theorem that Dirichlet proved it and I'm going to discuss you later, okay? So I'm saying that when you make all the classes of residue, the number of prime is equally distributed along any of these classes. So what Dirichlet is doing is something very, very interesting from a physicist's point of view, because he's just doing condensed matter on arithmetics. Because he takes the, the, the infinite number of uh, uh, integers and he put a period, like a crystal, a period Q. So you decide what is your modulus. You can choose 7, 13, 19, 23, you choose it. But once you choose it, you just make a modular arithmetics on this number. This is a mathematics which come from the genius of modular arithmetics as it was Gauss, he invented. So in this example of the watch, the modulus is 12, but there is a subtlety. You have to select those number in 12, which are no common divisor with 12. So in this case, one, five, seven, and 11. When you select them, you can construct a group, a group uh, multiplication like numbers, five times seven. The only thing you have to do is modulus the, 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 the number you have chosen. So when you do that, uh, all these uh, numbers really uh, fulfill uh, a table multiplication of a group, uh, modulus 12. Now you might wonder why the hell I cannot take two or four? Why I shall select myself only to those number which has no common divisor with the modulus? Well, the reason is pretty simple. If you take two, for instance, two by two is four, but two times eight uh, is 16, which modulus 12 is always four. And then, you know, to create a group uh, for any element should exist one and only one inverse. So if you include also the other number, you do not have a group, you have something else, okay? So, but if you restrict just to the number which has no common divisor with the modulus, you have just a group multiplication table. This group is pretty simple, it's a billion. And it's as a name, it's called the abelian group of prime residue class modulus Q. What is the dimension of this group? Well, it's the number of elements. This is an arithmetic function, which is called Euler Torian function. And you can uh, compute it uh, relatively easy. And is this in terms of Q and the prime which divide Q. Now, if uh, your modulus is a prime number, the dimension of this uh, group uh, is simply Q minus one. This is pretty simple because if you take seven, by definition, being a prime, each time you divide any number by seven, you can always find as a residue one, two, three, four, five, and six. Of course, seven or 14 is divided by seven. Yeah, but I'm talking about those which have no common division. On the other hand, if you take more complicated numbers, you have to compute the dimension of this, of this group and it's a nice exercise of doing it. Okay, so nothing, uh, nothing particular difficult, but kind of fancy, yes, for sure. Now, when you have a group, you can ask a more sophisticated question. What are the irreducible representation of the group? Since the group is a billion, the only reducible representation of this group I'm talking about are one dimensional, because it's a billion. And how many of them? Well, there is the theorem in group theory that say the number of the reducible representation is equal to the number of classes of the group. But the group is a billion. So the number of classes coincide with the elements. So 
there are as many characters, in this case, the character coincide with the irreducible representation being one dimensional, as many elements. And this character has to be phases, can only be phases, okay? Now, this arithmetic function, this character, satisfy a series of very elementary properties, which are this. First of all, it has to be periodic with Q, which is how I'm setting my arithmetics. They are purely multiplicative, like this, is zero only if the number n never share a common divisor with Q. And moreover, as a, any group theory, if you take an element and start uh, erasing to the power of the order of the group, uh, you have to arrive to the identity. So this means that these phases I'm talking about has to be root of unity, cannot be anything else. So let me do some simple example. Imagine I take the prime seven, okay, as a modulus. Well, the order of the group is six. So the uh, six root of uh, identity is i pi over three. So this means that uh, when I go to the characters, there will be se six functions, because the six is the order of the group, which is periodic with order six. And then I have to specify their value only for one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? Now, you know that characters of the group has many, many properties, like they are orthogonal if you do the column, they are orthogonal if you do the row and so on and so forth. So these functions are rigidly fixed. You cannot do much about it. These are, there are six of them, and you can compute it once you know what is the modulus. Now, notice that as is always the case, you have always the trivial representation where you take the character to be always one. This is the trivial representation of any group, okay? In this case, it's called principal character. Keep in mind because this will uh, play a role uh, in, in uh, soon, uh, soon later. So after I introduce this character, which I repeated, you give me a modulus, I compute this group, I compute this character, so I have this bunch of function. The Richelieu come, uh, uh, come across and say, look, construct this series in terms of the modulus, in terms of the character. Since they are purely multiplicative, all the, this kind of generalized Euler identity. The character are phases, and there are phi of Q of this function for any modulus. Now, physically, you can interpret them as partition function free bosons, which now has a U1 charges, actually no U1, but ZQ charges in a way, okay? So this is exactly what they are, because you are summing the configuration, but weight them with the charges they carry on, but modulus Zn, let's say. Now, notice, once I give this construction, that the Riemann function we start uh, our discussion is a very special case of this uh, general Dirichlet function. As a matter of fact, the Riemann function is when you choose the modulus one to be one, and therefore there is only one representation, the fundamental one. But you see, this is a, just a very special case. I have infinite number of this function to my disposal. This function satisfies functional equation as much as the Riemann, so our dual one, a, one minus s with s, the residue at the pole is an interesting story because if you are on the principal character, you have a sum of one and all of them sum to a number and therefore give you the singularity of the harmonic series. But if you are in any other character but the principal, you are summing the root of identity which sum up to zero. So if you take all the character but the principal one, there is no pole whatsoever. So these functions are inter, uh, entire functions. At this point, uh, we are ready to make the general scenario, the general picture. The general scenario is that the non-trivial zero of all the Richelieu function means for any modulus you like and for any character within the modulus are all 
along the critical line plays a one out. Okay, so this is generalized Riemann hypothesis. is a is an hypothesis which concerns an infinite class of function out of which Riemann adjusts are very teeny examples. So I'm gonna show you how you can argue about the validity of these things. Now. Uh, there is uh, what I'm going to tell you now is a little technical point, but uh, really of no harm whatsoever. Namely, you have to distinguish two different cases. You have already understood that the principal character somehow is a bit special because it, it ends up in having a Dirichlet function with a pole. All the other is no pole. So I have to distinguish L function principal character from all the others. Now at the deeper level, which is really the, 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 the paper I mentioned you at the very beginning, these two distinctions doesn't exist. It's just for the sake of presentation, but doesn't have, does not uh, exist such, such a sharp distinction. But let me just uh, for the sake of presentation uh, make this story because become much simpler. So L function principal character is a matter of fact for what the zeros are concerned are all equivalent to the Riemann function. The reason is, uh, if you take a modulus, the infinite product of this function involve all the prime except the modulus, okay? So what you do, you just complete, you put also the prime you, that you have excluded and you divide it. At this point, this extra term never has zeros. And you see this function and the Riemann has exactly the same zeros. So means that all the Dirichlet function of principal character for what the zeros are concerned are equivalent. So if you prove the Riemann hypothesis for zeta, you have proved it for all the principal character and vice versa. The one for non-principal characters has a different nature because they are entire function and somehow they share the same general properties that I'm going to tell you. They differ each other. There is no, no question about this, but uh, strict, I mean, largely speaking, broadly speaking, they are uh, just uh, an example of the same kind of function as you will understand in a minute. So in particular, the non-principal uh, uh, character, the Richelieu function has this structure in the complex plane, no pole, and only zeros in the complex plane. So they are entire function. Some of them, once again, are completely known because just come from the functional equation. Some are guessed to be on the axis one out. Also in this case, there is a residue formula which tell you that they grow like T log of T, blah, 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 blah. Is exactly a, a nice generalization Riemann in all aspects with the extra benefit that this function is no pole, okay? So this is what helped me in showing you in a very simple example, my argument. Because uh, uh, when I choose the non-principal character, and if you are interested in the total discussion, I refer you to this uh, recent paper, the, the, it's very simple to argue why they should be so, because uh, Take this sequence of integers, okay? These are one, two, three, four, five, and, and then I make the residue of them with respect to a uh, modulus, let's say seven. You see the, the sequence of the residue is completely boring. One, two, three, four, five, six, zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, zero. One, two, three, it's completely deterministic and boring. So from this point of view, there is no randomness. But imagine I ask you, can you tell me the residue when I superimpose the prime. So imagine now I ask you, can you tell me modulus seven, what is the residue of the primes? Well, at this point, the story changed completely. From a, out of a boring sequence, you get a series that you are not able to predict at least easily are completely deterministic. But if I ask you randomly, can you tell me the 100 member? You are unable to do it. You can do, of course, but require things. So if you look, the sequence of this residue appear really like a random sequence between one and six, okay? So this is once again, the origin of the location of the zeros of all this function, the axis one up, 
as now I'm going to show you on the basis of few very important theorem, which I'm going to present about the uh, Dirichlet function. So the main idea of my uh, argument is the following. I'm looking for enlarging the domain of convergence of the L function or the Mellin transform that originally was S equal larger than S equal one. So all the right-hand side of the plane. I want to see how much I can push in on the left-hand side and where I'm going to be stopped, okay? So this is the, the aim I want to do. It. So I take the uh, Dirichlet function, it's uh, infinite product representation. And if it's not principal character, if I take the log of this function, remember the non-principal character has only zeros. The log of this function is a perfect uh, uh, diagnosis for the zeros because the logarithm of P does diverge either if P has a pole or zeros, but P doesn't have pole if I'm an uh, entire function. So this is the difficult, the technical difficulties of extending the argument also to the Riemann. Can be done, but I'm just saying for the sake of the argument uh, this day, this is a very, very, very easy to do it. So once I do this, uh, I do the usual trick. I express this log in terms of the Richelieu series, I, in term, I express in terms of the Mellin, and the Mellin density is the sum of the cosine of this angle. However, computed along the sequence of primes. So this uh, angle, you do not know what they are uh, simply. They are not periodic at all, okay? So this is the sense of the things. So once again, if this uh, density di diverges a power law, alpha is uh, obviously identified as the location of the first zeros in the critical state. Simple like this. Therefore, if I'm able to show you that this uh, uh, function grows like square root of n, therefore, as I said, all the zeros on the critical line. Now I have to make uh, a little refinement of this argument because you might ask, but what about if I have logarithmic correction to this scaling law? Well, logarithmic never spoil this conclusion because imagine that the density goes like square root of n log of a, whatever a is, when you compute the Mellin, the location of the Mellin, the pole of the Mellin, always remain dictated by the power, never by the log. The log can only renormalize the, the, the residue of these things, but cannot, never can shift the location of the singular. This will be important in a minute, as you will understand. So summarizing, if I'm able, uh, I have to study the large asymptotic of this series and this will tell me where the zeros are located. I have to look this uh, this series. How these cosines are distributed? Well, this is the sequence of angle for a particular uh, uh, modulus. If I just make the histogram, you realize that this is exactly the same distribution of random angle, exactly the same. It's not a theorem. Not now, at least, but I'm telling you, they are just uh, a, a, as well as random angle. What is the sum? This one. What about if I divide it by the ordinary square root of n? Well, you have a function which looks always limited and dancing up and down like a random walk. Is it true? Well, I compare it with random walk. You see, the, the actual one is the black one. But this is one out of many, many of random work I can generate it on my computer uh, at my wish. So there is really no, no uh, feature which distinguishes uh, this car from the other. Now, when you talk about random work, of course, there are three classes of universality because the number, the random work can be super diffusive, alias the variance grows more than tau, grows exactly like tau, or grows. Uh, less than tau. Now, in our case, we can definitely exclude it that the random walk built on the Dirichlet grows like a, a sub-diffusive because we know already there are many, many zeros on the axis one half. 
There is a theorem by Hardy that say infinitely many zeros are on the axis one up. It didn't tell all the zeros are on the axis one up, but it say infinitely many are on the axis one up. Since this is true, this motion, of course, you can never push less than one half. will be stopped anyway by one half. So the super diffusive case is excluded a priori. So I remain to see if this motion is super diffusive, which means the existence of a zero outside the axis or just diffusive. In this case, all the zeros are on the axis one half, okay? Now, how you can have uh, a super diffusive uh, brown motion? Well, you should have correlations or you should have say Levy flight. The Levy flight are just the distribution of uh, displacement of birds. Most of the time, uh, birds are in certain region and then sometimes they migrate from Europe to Africa and they have a huge variance. At this point, of course, uh, how the uh, distance vary with time can have an anomalous uh, this uh, anomalous law. Now, what can we say about the term of this series? So the property of this series, well, first of all, all the term of this series are order one because are cosine. So this means a priori, I cannot have any lady flight. I cannot jump immediately from one value to another one. To arrive, I have to coherently adding up terms, okay? So no levy flight whatsoever. Moreover, there is a beautiful theorem, the Richelieu, which tell me, this is a theorem, it's not my statistical analysis, it is a theorem that the angle alias the residue are absolutely equiprobable. So if you are like St. Thomas, you don't believe it, you just go and make the experiments and you stunningly find that they are military equally distributed uh, one uh, uh, in uh, the other one. So essentially, you see, all I'm talking about uh, are like dice. I have a dice of Q phases, which I'm just dropping and collecting what's come up, okay? Indeed, uh, from this theorem, I can immediately tell you that the mean of this series vanish straight away. Now you might ask, but are these dice dubbed? Are they loaded? Are they rigged? So, oh, well, as usual, I do a, at the beginning a very uh, statistical analysis, like an experimental physicist. I want to see if this show any sign of correlation. So I take this angle and by a, by a physics consideration, you compute the correlation length, the correlation function. When you do that, what you discover that there are zero correlation, zero. So are either correlated to point are the same or, or zero. My God, then you are a physicist. So you say, well, but it's really so. You just look the more carefully here. I enlarge and you discover that there are correlations, but first of all, very, very, very small and randomly. Sometimes up, sometimes down, sometimes up, sometimes down, and so on. So you understand that there are finer size effects going on. Indeed, uh, if you make the power spectrum of this correlation function, if it was completely uncorrelated, you should find a flat curve. Well, the curve is not flat. Yeah, but it's not crazy either. Is uh, as much a curve can be flat given a finer size number of sampling, okay? If you take even uh, the uh, number which are uh, by definition randomly distributed, but you take thousand of them, you will never find flat curve. You find something which is finer side effect, okay? And this is what is happening. Indeed, as a matter of fact, at any finer sides, we have a very, very clear idea of the correlation of this residue. This is due to a paper of two years ago by Lemke Olive and Sundara Rajan. This uh, mathematician, ask the following question. On the sequence of prime, imagine that at the prime end, I know that the angle is theta, A. What is the probability that the next prime is theta B? Or what is the probability that after kappa step, I have theta C? Well, they are able to pin down such probability and they discover that they are like the POTS model. 
either the angle are equal and the probability is always the same, or if they are different, it's always the same as well. And the function is here. So let me show you the formula. So this FAA tell me the probability of finding two residue equal, keep in mind the angle are a function of the residue. So it's a complete equivalent if I, if I talk angle or residue. So if they are equal, they are anti-correlated, anti-correlated, there is a one minus something. If they are different, they are correlated. However, look at the, the, the dependence from the finer sides of your sampling, one or log n. So if uh, I'm extending my analysis n to infinity, which I have to do it because uh, Mellin involved the infinity, you arrive to the standing conclusion that this residue are uncorrelated, okay? At this point you have done because of this time series, I, the average is zero. They are equally distributed. They are uncorrelated. So you can compute any moments. You find just the distribution of uncorrelated variables. However, I'm not uh, talking the variance. I'm talking the function itself. So you have to do the low iterated log. So you have to look uh, how a Brownian motion uh, uh, out depend on the tails. So this depends in this way, which is a beautiful uh, theorem by Kolmogorov. And this is where appeared the log log correction I was talking about, which never spoil however the argument. So let me just go very, very fast to the end. So this concluded the probabilistic theoretical part. But as I said, we are a physicist, so I'm really um, curious to see how these analyses uh, are confirmed by the, the numbers. But you have the problem that the series is deterministic. So you have to sampling a deterministic series. And this is a common problem in this kind of stuff and actually come really from the history of physics, from the world of Perren and the determination of, of Avogadro number just using few trajectory. So what you do is when you have a deterministic series that you suspect to be random, you just chop it in all possible way. You can chop it as you like it because the series is infinite. I can choose how large is this chopping, where far they are and so on. You define the block variable. And if you have reason to suspect the original series goes like square root of n, you should find that any subset should go like square root of l. So this is what I've done. I've done a huge battery of very, very, very sophisticated statistical tests of increasing order of complexities, always find stunning confirmation of the randomness of this value, okay? So let me just show two of them and then I conclude. When you have a pure random walk, that start from the origin, there is a time mean where it reach really the minimum of the, the, the walk and the maximum. And then there is tau, which is the difference between these two times. This is a random variable. And you can compute how it's distributed if the motion is assumed to be random. It's a highly crazy function that has been computed the last years. Is this black curve. So you can see it's a highly crazy function. It's not something simple. Well, if you plot the data, it just goes one on top of the other. And graph all like this, I have thousands. Each of them confirms standingly the hypothesis that this variable are random, okay? Another one is that they compute the variance of this block. I can compute theoretically this variance. Is this the formula? And then this tell me that this variance should scale linear, but you see there is logarithmic correction, which depends on the finer sides because here is the finer sides. So each time that I analyze my variable, of course I have a finite size. I cannot go to infinity, so I have to take care of it. Is it true? Well, the conclusion is that this variance should scale like L independent of any modulus. So I take a huge amount of numbers. These are just a sample, but I can arrive 10 to the 20 or something like this. I do what I did. I sample this and look at all the variance. No matter how I change the character, no matter how I change the modulus, the variance is always linear with slope one. You can go on forever. There is a universal variance, which is this. And if I plot my block variable, 
stunning Gaussian with a very high test key square on the feet. Okay, so that's it. This is the story. You might ask, yeah, but you have done uh, this analysis a large end, but always find it. Well, I can tell you that if you go larger, it's even better. Because when I do the sampling of finite n, if I enlarge n, the previous guy just become a block variable, the largest one. And I keep, keep going. But the theory predicted it's correction one over log n. So it has to be even better and better. So concluding, the singularity of the Mellin transform rule the zeros. These are dictated by the sum of the residue. These are deterministic, but as very, uh, strong uh, random uh, nature. Therefore, this series go like square root of n, and therefore all the zeros has to be on the critical axis. You have no choice. And so you see, with all this, uh, you can say that generalized Riemann hypothesis and Riemann hypothesis them itself, from a physics point of view, is just a random walk theorem, nothing else. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. Okay, so I clap uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, Giuseppe. So thank you for this uh, uh, very nice uh, seminar. Um, so if uh, there are uh, questions, I, I will ask to write on the chat. Um, so let's... Uh... I think Cristiani uh, raised her hand. Oh, so... Okay, yes. So... Ciao, Please. Cristiana. Ciao. Giuseppe, ciao. ciao. Thanks nice a lot. Yeah. Such a wonderful seminar. I'm here, highly excited. So, is it so that what you were telling us is that you were relating the, the a function to things which have simply a Gaussian distribution? And if you want to look at more complex processes like Levy, which don't have a Gaussian, but they are going to have a Lorentzian, you will need a different set of functions. Yeah, yeah. You will need oh, something that generalizes. You are simply looking at omic dissipation, where you, uh, um, you just have a linear dependence. And if you want to get any kind of subdiffusion or super diffusion, super diffusion like Levy, you don't have Gaussians, you have uh, Lorentzians. So Absolutely. you will have a generalization of this type of motions, which are uh, of functions, which are no longer the, the Riemann, yeah. but something else. Yeah, so let, let me tell you the story. What I present is a very specific deterministic function. I try to spell out the random properties, okay? Yes. But you yes. can invert the argument. You, sure. can, define, you can define yourself a function which has coefficients which are distributed probabilistically according to your distributions. Yes. Well, in that case, it's a theorem. Yes. Function which are distributed in such a such a way, the singularity with probability one is, and then you derive where they are uh, distributed. You see, uh -huh. for instance, uh -huh. if you take uh, a, a random variable whose average is not zero but is uh, three, this function with probability one has all the pole on the line three. Uh huh. Okay. So in this case, it's pretty simple. The, you see the difficulty is, is to show that a probabilistic set of uh, functions displays probabilistic properties. But the vice versa is pretty simple. If I you have a probabilistic so. function, it's pretty simple to prove everything. But uh, one thing that's quite curious though, so we have been looking at a fractional Langevin equation. Sure. Okay, so it's not real, it's subdiffusive Brown and motion where instead of having an MQ dot, you have uh, M with a fractional derivative of the position. Sure, sure, sure. With S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's quite curious because now when you look at the correlations, you, uh, when you try to define correlations and you have to break equipartition to, to, to look at a quantum system at very low temperatures to get a white noise, the, the terms that appear in the correlation are precisely the same ones from the Riemann zeta, this sign of pi s over two, gamma of s minus one, oh, they appear wow. in our correlation <laughs> functions, Rebarkable. which is now a fractional <laughs> derivative s. Okay, you, you have see? to tell me, 
You have to tell that me is more quite details. Quite curious. <laughs> I, I was very excited when I have seen them appearing there in your Zita. Okay. Okay. Thanks. We we will organize a, a, yes. a, a talk. We together. have to talk Thank about you. that. Very, very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Very interesting. So first. Uh, thank you very much, Joseph, for a beautiful talk. Uh, you mentioned that the distribution of zeros on, on the vertical line is somehow related to random matrix models and yeah. the study by Michael Berry. Yeah. Uh, can you comment a little bit on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, Thanks. In, then, yeah, obviously, I skip a beautiful part of the story, really beautiful for, for obvious reasons. Uh, now, I told you that there is a, a, a nice way of understanding where the real part of these zeros are located. This is my talk. I never tell you how they are distributed along the line. These completely different stories. So what has been discovered uh, with kind of trial and error, and then people develop more uh, consideration, is that if you properly normalize the gap of these uh, zeros, because you have to make what is called folding. So you take the, the separation between this zero, then you renormalize to their average, which I mean, it grows. When you make the correlation between them, you find out that they are described with very, very good accuracy by random matrix theorem. And this was discovered by Montgomery with the hint of Dyson and this and that. And Michael Berry, John Keating, and many, many others has made a beautiful uh, Conray and so on, as beautiful uh, paper in related moments of the Riemann. So when you describe Riemann to the power 2K and you average in a way, to uh, how these numbers can be computed in terms of the random matrices and it's beautiful combinatorics and mathematics and they found this matching. Now this, uh, uh, I can tell you my, why should happen like that? In my opinion, probably I'm wrong. Eh? It's my way of understanding these things because there is no proof. I mean, it's just uh, something you do, then uh, you can convince yourself more and more. And then the reason is uh, a theorem which is called a Voronin theorem, which tell you stunning uh, things of the Riemann. It says that if you move along the critical axis of the Riemann and you take any function, any with some uh, just a very mild assumption. With probability one, you will always find segment of the Riemann where there is a perfect match with your function. So this means that this Riemann is a universal function. Big universal means that if you look around, uh, I mean, this can be whatever. <laughs> So there should be another features of randomness in this direction, in this direction, which allow you to have a random matrix description of some properties, because you ask questions like moments of this, you ask questions which are, uh, you never ask where is the hundred zeros. This is deterministic. You are asking something which is coarse graining property of this function, you see? And this is described once again by probabilistic formalism. So this is, uh, of course, uh, I mean, there are uh, experts, more uh, more expert than me on this uh, stuff. Actually, it would be nice to have I some talk about this. Make another seminar about Yeah, this. exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, do, you, do you have just, just a uh, comment in the end? So you showed this, uh, uh, some, for, for the melon weight function, you show that you expected behavior to be square root of n and the, the parameter epsilon, which as far as I understand, just uh, shows how far you are from a $1 million prize, right? Uh, do no, you no, 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 wait, no, 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 I, I disagree. Actually, the real uh, theorem, theorem, the real uh, formulation of the uh, Riemann hypothesis involve the epsilon. It's necessary, it's crucial. So if you look the formulation, it says the zeros of the Riemann, so let me tell you the, the things, are distributed on the uh, line one half plus F. By epsilon is, is arbitrarily small, it's a, a your wish, okay? Because you can go no matter how you close to it, meaning uh, in, my, in my probabilistic approach that the random walk can never be square root of N. Because I'm not, 
I'm not uh, discussing the moment of this land of work. I'm discussing how large this displacement can be. So you have to be careful to the uh, to the deviation, to the rare event which can blow up your function. But the, the theorem of uh, Kolmogorov is very beautiful because it say the function is not like square root of n. If you divide it, diverge. However, the function has log or log of n. So this is the beautiful of, of uh, Kolmogorov, which tell you exactly the bound of this. So the, the Kolmogorov theorem, which is this, uh, allow you to bound once for all, this, this one, allows to bound one for all for any random walk, any, any. So for any random walk, the limb soup of the displacement cannot be larger than square root of n, but with correction log or log of n. Because you see, when you have a random walk, uh, it's true that the maximum value of the, of the random walk uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, here in the middle is here in the middle, uh, but you have the tail. So the motion can be somewhere else at infinity. What Kolmogorov tell us is that, yeah, you can go to infinity, but not really fast. You can always go log log of n. So this is a theorem of probability. It's not, uh, it's not my limitation. It's a <laughs> the epsilon is there. <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's not the epsilon which uh, keep you away from the one billion price, not this. <laughs> but keep you away something else, but not this episode. All right, well, thank you very much. Okay, because this is really bound how much this guy can grow as a function, not as a, as a moment. Uh, we have a question yes. by Andrea Capelli. Yes, yes. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I got a bit lost. So, I mean, starting, I, I understand that uh, the, uh, the Riemann hypothesis is still an hypothesis. So you don't have a proof. No, okay. I have a probabilistic proof, Andrea. I have a probabilistic proof, probabilistic. I have a proof, which however is probabilistic. It's like if you say, what is the probability of having, uh, I don't know, you ask something with probability one, the Riemann hypothesis is true. Okay. Yeah, but uh, so I understood that you have a connection of the uh, Riemann hypothesis to the, to the property of this, uh, of this number to, to be a, a real uh, uh, random work, okay? Yeah. And, but then you prove that this, or somebody proved that this is really a random work? Yeah, no? it's what I told you. You see, this is the point. This, uh, I express the melding of all the, all the Dirichlet, including Riemann, I can express all, in terms of this density, okay? Yeah. So there are two theorems that Grishlet tell you that all the values of this function are equiprobable. It's like a dice, it's a theorem. Okay. And then I have also the correlation among them, which asymptotically tell me they are completely uncorrelated. All the correlation I found between them are finite size effect. So what is your contribution then? I mean, they already guys, said this. No, no, but nobody have put all the story together. <laughs> this is very simple, okay, Andrea. So the interpretation of these results in terms of the physical picture of the random walk is yours. Yeah. Is that the point? Yeah. And then I dig all this stuff. I did uh, 10 to the 20 analysis. I did all this analysis. Please do yourself. Yeah, but there is a theorem. I understand. Then, the, the theorem tell me that it is un uncorrelated. Andrea, and you, is, uh, you find it is uncorrelated. Andrea, okay, is Andrea, theorem. Andrea, Andrea. The theorem, first of all, is probabilistic for large, large n, asymptotically, is a theorem. But as I said, I'm some Thomas. I want to check, and I want to check how is good for finite size. I, I, I say it. 
there is a theorem. So if you are happy with okay. probabilistic theorem finished, I can stop the seminar here, okay? But then I say, I would like to check. I would like to see. Mm -hmm. So it's like you have the standard model that tell you the X. Then you go to CERN and you do the experiment, but you cannot tell to the experimentalist in CERN, why the hell you have done the experiments? I know exist. Yeah, it's the same attitude. There is a theorem, uh, probability, yes, probability. Okay, okay, a probability. Okay, now, uh, now I understood better. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, and then I, I really check and, and, and discover that are stunning rigid, stunning. Something that is not expected, eh? because you might expect uh, that this is asymptotic, maybe there is uh, some uh, correlation which persists that might invalidate the things and so on. No, my analysis, absolutely obsessive, I can say, show that there are no correlation whatsoever from finite size uh, number to infinity. There are none. Okay. Okay, but there is also this theorem uh, by Kolmogorov that tells you what is the finite size correction. No, 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 no. It's How much is the course. size of finite size correction? No, no. It's a completely uh -huh. different story. Kolmogorov uh -huh. okay. tells story. No, Kolmogorov tells you if you have, by definition, a Brownian motion, by definition, probabilistic random motion. Okay. What, how, how much is uh, the displacement okay, but, of the motion? Okay, now I understood. Not for your problem, but for a, for a generic random walk, okay. For a okay. pure random walk, okay, okay, defined no, in probabilistic. Okay, okay. I have variables which looks probabilistic. However, there are funny correlations, subtle correlations, that I spot it and kill it and show that they will not spoil the final result. You see? So please okay, do can not you compare, that Can you compare the final size effects with the one suggested by Kolmogorov theorem? Sure. And uh, indeed, the Kolmogorov. They are the same. Uh, or yeah, they are Andrea, different. Andrea, don't, don't, uh, you have to, uh, to understand the, 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 the meaning of. Uh, what Kolmogorov is telling you. Kolmogorov is telling you that the limb of soup of this guy cannot be larger than this. If you oh, do- okay. it's, a bound. it's a bound, okay. Yeah, if you do the actual story, I told you, if you do the actual uh, experiments, this is about, look, this is about. Uh -huh. okay, okay. Look how it is. It's very much uh, validated. You see, it's even bounded this function, at least on this scale. Thank you very much, Giuseppe, for your... Uh, thank you to you for your invitation. Please uh, say hello to all the friends and, uh, in uh, Natal and all the people that attended. Thank you very much for uh, your interest and uh, for uh, the question. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye, okay. guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Ciao. Ciao to all. Ciao. 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 Ciao, Cristiano. Ciao. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye bye everyone. Ciao, Jacobo. Ciao. Ciao, Giuseppe.